friends uh, who were not uh, present there. So uh, only only two words, uh, Maria Rosa Antoniat, uh, who is now our visiting uh, professor, uh, so to speak, virtually in Milan. Uh, she, um, she teaches uh, at um, uh, King's College London. Uh, she is... Uh, uh, Mm, she is uh, currently um, president, uh, chair, chair of the British Association in history in the history of philosophy, and uh, uh, president uh, of the uh, British Association of Philosophy of Religion. And uh, uh, she is a well-known uh, scholar in history of philosophy, in particular uh, early modern philosophy, and more especially Leibniz. Uh, she began uh, her studies and research on, on Leibniz uh, with, the, with a pioneering study on Leibniz's uh, theology, uh, philosophy, religion. And then uh, uh, some years ago, he published uh, a biography, uh, Leibniz, an intellectual biography, uh, which uh, is uh, now um, considered uh, so a reference uh, work uh, a standard a standard reference uh, book for uh, for Leibniz's uh, biography and she also uh, edited the um, Oxford handbook on Leibniz um, so uh, today uh, Maria Rosa uh, um, uh, gives a lecture on the benefit to philosophy of the study of, it, of its history, and this is the title of a paper uh, else, uh, which was published, uh, uh, if I, I, I'm not mistaken, in uh, uh, 2015, 15. and uh, and uh, uh, which. Uh, uh, which was the occasion for a lively debate, um, in, uh, especially in the English-speaking world. Actually, the topic, the topic of uh, uh, the, the relationship between uh, history of philosophy and philosophy is a, so to speak, a traditional one, uh, or, or one which cyclically reproposes itself. Uh, it was. Uh, Notoriously debated uh, in, uh, in in the Italian culture uh, already in the 60s, or in French culture and so on. Maybe uh, in the in the English speaking uh, in the English speaking uh, uh, philosophical uh, milieu, uh, of course uh, uh, the the situation uh, the starting point was different from ours. So. Uh, the intervention of Maria Rosa uh, raised the uh, the interest uh, for for the issue, and I think uh, provides uh, uh, also us uh, uh, with a fresh look on uh, on this uh, on this topic. And uh, we we choose we we invited Maria Rosa uh, to tell about this uh, uh, because uh, it seemed to. To us, that uh, uh, it, it was a good uh, a good uh, uh, topic uh, to propose uh, uh, for a discussion uh, for a, it, it given to the department uh, because uh, uh, it is something that uh, could, uh, in a way, uh, yeah, uh, where where uh, different different uh, uh, academic uh, skills. Uh, and uh, the disciplines uh, uh, could and should uh, have a, a dialogue. Uh, I think uh, an interesting dialogue. So uh, I give uh, I give uh, Maria Rosa uh, the word and uh, for for her speech. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for this uh, generous introduction. Um, I will. Uh, uh, yeah, just to point out that uh, the handout for this uh, paper is posted in the chat. So I hope uh, um, you will be able uh, also to download it if you want. And uh, I will uh, share my screen in a moment so we can uh, follow together. 
let me just uh, say that uh, if I were to go out of virtual existence uh, for a moment, uh, don't be alarmed, it happened before, and uh, so far I always managed to come back to virtual existence uh, after a couple of minutes. So if that happens, don't go away, hopefully I will be back, but let's hope it will not happen. And uh, now I will uh, um, try to share my screen. Hopefully this uh, will uh, work. Well, Maria Rosa, it's the other way around. We, you were already sharing it. Now it's ah. gone. Oh, now it's gone. No, uh, uh, it was shared before. It was shared before. Great. Right. OK, let me see if uh, no, now it's not shared. OK. Let me try again. What about now? OK. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Oh, great. For a moment, okay. uh, I, I, I feared uh, that I couldn't do it again. OK, the benefit uh, to philosophy of the study of its uh, history. Now, the first version of this paper um, was uh, I gave it at King's College uh, London uh, as my inaugural lecture at King's College London uh, because uh, it has a sort of uh, uh, programmatic, uh, if you like, uh, um, character and it is a way to make a case, especially to my colleague in the Anglo-American world, why there is a benefit to philosophy of the study of its history. So I will advance in this paper the view that the history of philosophy is both a kind of history and a kind of philosophy. As a kind of history, I claim it must meet the standards of any other serious historical research, including the use of the relevant linguistic and philological tools and the study of the broader political, cultural, scientific and religious contexts in which more strictly philosophical views are developed. And uh, this is some uh, uh, um, cover some of my work in work in which uh, I have uh, tried uh, to illuminate uh, certain uh, philosophical commitments of Leibniz by placing them in the broader, especially theological, but also scientific cultural context. So the claim is that the history of philosophy must also be history in a serious, uh, robust way. At the same time, the claim is that it's also a kind of philosophy. Its ultimate, and as a kind of philosophy, its ultimate aim is a substantive engagement with those very philosophical views. First, in striving to understand them on their own terms, and secondly, in probing and interrogating them as possible answers to central questions of enduring philosophical relevance. So let me stop for a moment there, because here there is a, a, a claim which needs some explanation. So the claim that there are central questions of enduring philosophical relevance. Not everybody will agree with this, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, there is an historicist uh, view uh, um, thinking that uh, uh, history will uh, would uh, and uh, should cure you of this very idea that uh, there are enduring philosophical relevance. Uh, it it uh, should give you the idea that uh, the problems are not, are not the same. I don't uh, agree with that. And uh, I, I do think that there are uh, problems uh, which have enduring significance across uh, times, across uh, context. Uh, it might be a matter of learning the language uh, and translating, uh, but I think uh, problems like uh, uh, the nature of what is ultimately real uh, or uh, the nature of knowledge uh, have uh, enduring philosophical relevance. Uh, this is uh, different, uh, I think, uh, from uh, not being uh, um, alerted uh, to the sense of contingency of the way in which a certain uh, 
problems are historically discussed. And uh, indeed, uh, as I will try to show with the second of my examples, um, I think the history of philosophy is particularly good in uh, avoiding uh, to mistake uh, what is uh, uh, the result of historical contingencies uh, or the result of uh, cultural contest, uh, uh, avoiding to mistake that for some kind, some kind of uh, timeless uh, universal, uh, universal truth. At the very least, uh, as I will uh, uh, try to show with my second uh, example, the history of philosophies uh, is uh, really a, a, an excellent uh, tool uh, for uh, avoiding uh, collapsing uh, the latest uh, mainstream uh, orthodoxy, if not uh, into an eternal truth, uh, at least uh, into the best uh, explanation of full stop. So having said that, uh, I do think uh, that uh, uh, there are uh, um, there is a sort of philosophia perennis uh, which runs uh, through the history of philosophy and uh, which uh, in, in, a, in a certain way transcend also times uh, and uh, contests. Uh, these uh, thesis which I am going to defend that the history of philosophy is both a kind of history and a kind uh, of uh, philosophy is also to be um, understood uh, against uh, a certain uh, background. And this uh, background is the background in, in which, uh, um, even nowadays, uh, and maybe especially in the Anglo American uh, world, uh, there are uh, two approaches uh, which uh, are uh, still, as it were, uh, uh, fighting uh, with one another. And uh, one is uh, what is called uh, the uh, appropriation sort of uh, approach in which uh, uh, the idea is that it doesn't really matter who said what or, or even uh, if uh, somebody really said something uh, but all that matters is the argument uh, the cogency so uh, it's fine to go back and just to mine one uh, argument here and there never mind if uh, that is out of context if that is not what a certain author uh, intended to say because of what import is important is just uh, the cogency of that argument so this is the appropriation uh, approach and the other one uh, is uh, the contextualist uh, approach so the idea that when one is doing history of philosophy one is just a uh, catering for uh, historical exactitude and therefore one should uh, avoid uh, uh, actually to try to uh, do philosophy while you are doing that. Now, these uh, two different approaches uh, are not new. And uh, if you like, uh, one of the classic uh, uh, authors in which you find them is Russell. And uh, you find that in uh, his uh, introduction uh, to the philosophy of Leibniz, uh, when uh, uh, Russell says uh, that uh, there are uh, two sort of objects for the history of philosophy. One is an historical object, it has to do with influences, with contest, and the, one, uh, and the other one is a philosophical uh, object, uh, and uh, it doesn't care about influences, uh, contest, uh, and all that, it just uh, cares about uh, the uh, intrinsic uh, philosophical uh, cogency of uh, the great system the great systems of philosophy. And uh, Russell is quite clear that uh, he is pursuing the second enterprise, uh, and he really doesn't think that one, uh, at least himself, uh, he does not care about uh, the first one. So my, against this uh, backdrop, uh, my uh, claim uh, is that uh, no, these are uh, two sides of the same uh, coin. It's both a kind of history and a kind of philosophy. So I will try to uh, argue for this thesis not by presenting a new theoretical framework, but by presenting three case studies in which it seems to me that uh, the engagement 
with the history of philosophy is clearly beneficial to philosophy itself. And these three examples will be the first from epistemology, the second from metaphysics, and the third from the historiography of philosophy itself. I will come to the conclusion that doing history of philosophy is a way to think outside the box of the latest philosophical orthodoxy. Somewhat paradoxically, far from imprisoning its students into the straight jacket of an out outdated and crystallized view, I claim that the history of philosophy trains the mind to think differently and alternatively about the fundamental problems of philosophy. It keeps us alert to the fact that the last is not always best, and that a genuinely new perspective often means embracing and developing an older insight. So that is what I now set out to illustrate by going to my three um, cases. And uh, these, uh, these three cases uh, draw on uh, my own experience uh, my own practice of doing uh, uh, history of philosophy. The first one uh, is epistemology, how traditional is the traditional analysis of uh, knowledge. And I think that uh, perhaps the most salient example uh, of the benefit to philosophy of a non-anachronistic engagement with its history comes uh, from uh, epistemology. And uh, um, let me add here that uh, this is, uh, a, as it were, uh, a, um, a development and expansion of this uh, section uh, of my talk uh, is actually my current research, uh, research project uh, and uh, is uh, the book uh, I am writing for OUP and which I am hoping to have an opportunity to discuss in September. Uh, when uh, Deo Volente, I will uh, uh, be able, to, I hope, to come in person to Milan. So as it were, this is uh, uh, part of what, uh, of what I am doing, and uh, it is also based uh, on uh, uh, two papers, uh, one uh, which I have uh, written uh, uh, together with Michael Ayers, and uh, which is uh, on knowledge and belief uh, from Plato to Locke, and which is now published uh, in uh, uh, the recent book by Michael Ayers on knowing and seeing. And uh, the other um, paper where I discuss uh, what I'm going to here just to summarize uh, very briefly is uh, a paper on the distinction in kind between knowledge and belief, uh, which has appeared uh, um, last year now in the proceedings uh, of the Aristotelian Society. So we are frequently told, especially in the Anglo-American uh, world in which I work, that on the traditional or standard understanding of knowledge, knowledge that P is uh, at least uh, approximately justified through belief. If uh, you go to epistemology in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a kind of Bible for all uh, philosophy students, uh, that is the definition you find, that uh, that is uh, the standard uh, um, understanding of knowledge, uh, justified through belief, or the traditional understanding of knowledge. So the story continues. Uh, Edmund Gettier, in a paper of 1963, blew a huge hole in uh, this long uh, tradition uh, of thinking that knowledge is justified through belief, uh, stretching back to Plato by exposing uh, the fact that justifies through belief uh, is not uh, sufficient for knowledge. If you are then uh, familiar with uh, post gettier epistemology, you will see that it has been uh, uh, the story of post gettier epistemology to look for the elusive uh, fourth condition to add to justify true belief to arrive 
uh, these uh, um, not only necessary but also sufficient uh, conditions uh, of knowledge. And here is my question. How traditional is this uh, traditional uh, analysis of knowledge? If one returns uh, to examining the uh, main uh, figures uh, and traditions uh, in the history of philosophy, the standard analysis begins uh, to look surprisingly non-standard. The traditional view, it appears, uh, is not a tradition stretching back uh, to the infancy of philosophy with Plato, the epistemic naivety of which was finally exposed in 1963 by Gettier's short paper, instead it begins to look like a 20th century view, prominently, prominent especially in the Anglo-American world, which after the middle of the century has repeatedly tried and now according to many failed to correct itself. If one goes back to the history of philosophy, one finds instead uh, a genuine, a persistent uh, and genuinely traditional uh, strand of thought, which, according to which uh, knowledge uh, derives uh, directly from its object, uh, which is uh, present in a primitive and irreducible way to the mind uh, of the knower. That is, uh, in uh, different ways, uh, knowledge is a primitive perception uh, or irreducible mental seeing uh, what is the case. Uh, knowledge is a primitive uh, present of uh, what is uh, to own uh, in uh, Plato, to the mind or to, depending whether you are uh, or are not uh, an empiricist, also to the senses, uh, in which there is uh, no gap uh, between uh, knower and known. Belief, on the contrary, is uh, a, a different mental state uh, is a mental state of cognitive mode in which precisely the perception or presence which characterizes knowledge is lacking and assent to the object of cognition is given rightly or wrongly on grounds external to the object itself. If you like, we can then go into some example of that. The grounds for believing may be very strong and belief uh, can be true and strongly justified. Uh, and still on this traditional account, uh, such a believer uh, would not be knowledge, uh, but a different mental state or cognitive mode, uh, which cannot be turned uh, into knowledge uh, without stopping to be, strictly speaking, uh, belief. So I think much traditional epistemology would have certainly agreed that a justified true belief is not sufficient for knowledge. But not because something else should be added to true justified belief, but because knowledge and belief are different in kind. And I think you find this in, in Plato, far from being the father of the justified true belief analysis, it seems to me that Plato is very clear that there is a distinction in kind uh, between episteme and doxa, between nose and doxa. Knowledge is not a species, so episteme is not a species of, doc, uh, of doxa. Knowledge is not a species of belief which meets certain criteria. Belief and knowledge, on the other hand, uh, can both be conceived uh, as uh, two different ways uh, of thinking uh, with assent. And uh, here for me, uh, um, an important inspiration uh, is uh, provided by Aquinas uh, and uh, by the way in which uh, um, in Aquinas' uh, view are uh, really captured uh, a number of views uh, which were uh, uh, there in the tradition of both uh, coming from Plato and coming from uh, Aristotle. I will uh, read out uh, these uh, two quotations from, uh, um, from, from Aquinas because I think uh, they are particularly good in summarizing this tradition, uh, which uh, I, I, I think should be recovered. 
Now the intellect uh, assents, assented to something in two ways. One way, because it is a move that was sent by the object itself at ipso objecto, which is known either to itself, as in the case of first principles, of which there is understanding, intellectus, or through something else already known, as in the case of conclusions, of which there is knowledge, scientia. In another way, the intellect assents to something, not because it is sufficiently moved to this ascent by its proper object, so there is not this present of its proper object as in intellectus or in scientia, in which you, your ascent is moved by seeing it. So it, uh, in another way, the intellect ascent to something, not because it is sufficiently moved to this ascent by its proper object, but through a certain voluntary choice uh, turning toward uh, one side rather than the other. And uh, if this is done with doubt or fear of the opposite, uh, of the opposite side, there will be opinion, uh, opinion. If on the other end, uh, this is done with a certainty and without such fear, there will be faith, fides. So fides, uh, is not on the side of the intellectus or the scientia, is on the side of credere, which is a different cognitive mode, is a different way to ascend to the object of cognition because the object of cognition is not directly present. Now, those things are said to be seen, videri di culto, which by themselves move our intellect or the senses to knowledge of them. Wherefore, it is uh, evident, uh, manifestum est, uh, that uh, neither faith nor opinion can be of things uh, seen, either by the senses or by the intellect. And in this other quotation, uh, Aquinas uh, is uh, putting the same point uh, more uh, succinctly. The reason why the same thing uh, cannot simultaneously and in the same respect to be known and believed. So these are two mutually exclusive mental states. Is that what is known is seen, whereas what is believed is not seen. OK, now Aquinas may be accused of many things. But uh, amongst these is not wishing to undermine belief uh, or religious belief uh, in particular. What he's saying is that we have to acknowledge that there are different cognitive modes. One is the cognitive mode of the intellect, the understanding in which you see something, a truth, an intelligible truth, for instance, and the scientia. And another one in which uh, the object of cognition, uh, for instance, in the case uh, of the uh, nature of God, uh, let's say, is not directly present and you have to assent to it uh, for reasons, uh, good reasons, uh, which are external to the object itself. Now, interesting enough, uh, in an um, author uh, who is in many ways very different from Aquinas, Locke, one find the same sort of relationship between knowing and believing. And there are even passages which are really strikingly similar on this. Perceiving some truth or thing is not a matter of having justification for a belief. It is not the presence or absence of firm assent which distinguishes knowledge from belief. One could have very high degree of assent also in belief, but the presence or absence of clear sight, manifesta visio of the object of cognition, the presence or absence of direct cognitive contact with what is. To conclude, a number of epistemologists have now come to the conclusion that the analysis of knowledge as a belief plus the addition of some conditions does not work. 
A case in point uh, is uh, um, Timothy Williamson, uh, Knowledge of First Epistemology, which uh, where I am uh, is now really taking the world by storm, uh, which is uh, precisely pushing back on this and saying uh, no, uh, knowledge is not belief, uh, plus uh, the addition uh, of uh, some conditions. Perhaps this is why historically the traditional accounts of knowledge central to Western philosophy did not take knowledge uh, to be a kind of belief uh, which meets certain uh, criteria. So it seems to me that uh, that was not the traditional way to think of it, and there have been uh, work done uh, uh, on ancient uh, philosophy in particular, um, pushing back on the idea that Plato should be, re should be read uh, in that way. So what happened uh, is that uh, there was uh, this uh, uh, in the 20th century, mid 20th century, this uh, uh, conception uh, uh, took hold uh, and uh, people glance back at the past and say, well, well let's see if there is uh, some rudimentary um, version of that uh, in the past. We propose, uh, and I mean uh, myself and Michael Ayers, uh, that something like the earlier genuinely traditional conception of knowledge and its relation to belief, purged of some unacceptable elements, constitutes a fruitful alternative to the project of identifying the criteria that belief must satisfy in order to be knowledge. So for today's purposes, for this talk purpose, what I wanted to stress uh, is uh, that far from uh, displaying uh, epistemic naivety, the history of philosophy displays uh, a genuine uh, insight which may help uh, setting back uh, on the right track uh, 21st century epistemology. So this was uh, my first example. Uh, which, as I said, uh, is, uh, as it were, was the starting point of the project I am uh, pursuing now. Uh, the second example is from metaphysics and thinking about matter. So those who came to uh, the seminar on Leibniz will recognize here my paper, or part of the claims in my paper on primary matter. So what is matter? Many people will probably reply that it is uh, roughly the stuff uh, which we experience as a standard uh, and as offering uh, some degree of resistance of which physical objects uh, are made up. This uh, common sense uh, pre-theoretical picture was a plausible approximation in the fairly immediately intelligible world uh, of mechanistic physics. However, the strange world of modern physics makes it much more inaccurate to think of physical objects or body, bodies as ultimately made up of the extended stuff that we experience. Once you, you go into quantum physics and uh, theory of relativity and so on, you, you don't find uh, this stuff, uh, this extended stuff anymore. One could uh, even argue that modern physics has no use for the concept of matter in its technical work. We need uh, to turn, therefore, to philosophy in order to probe our pre-theoretical uh, understanding of matter and determine the role uh, that uh, the concept of matter may play in uh, an inquiry into what is a uh, ultimately real. If one turns specifically to the history of philosophy, one finds ways of explaining what matter is, which challenge assumptions, expose the problems of prima facie satisfactory accounts, and force us to consider unfamiliar and yet powerful possible alternatives. In a nutshell, one of the things that the history of philosophy does is keeping the mind open to alternative perspectives 
as well as resistant to settling easily for commonly held views or common sense beliefs. For instance, Leibniz is a prime example of that. Leibniz, as I have argued in my paper on primary matter, moves away from the broadly Aristotelian framework of primary substances as a composite of two ontological constituents, form and matter, of which matter is the ultimate subject of inherence. Leibniz moves away from that toward the more frankly Neoplatonic or more precisely Plotinian framework in which matter is identified with non being. Far from being what is ultimately real, it is identified with non being. Matter is merely a way to express the negation of some further perfection. Matter is just a noun, a way to describe the necessary limitation of the active power or force which constitutes created simple substances or monads. It is not a positive constituent which must be added to force in order to have a substance. And here you will recognize my um, one of my favorite quotations, the matter of things is uh, nothing uh, that is a uh, limitation. Materia rerum est nilum. Now, my aim here is not to argue that Leibniz was right. Rather, I wish simply to note that Leibniz's proposal constitutes one of a handful of a genuinely alternative ways of thinking about matter, arriving at the conclusion that what is ultimately real it's not the standard stuff, but uh, active uh, powers or forces. This metaphysical model uh, challenges uh, more immediately intuitive accounts. If nothing else, it exposes the problems uh, that uh, such accounts uh, will have to face uh, if they wish to maintain uh, their claim uh, of being uh, the best uh, on the market. So I draw here a lesson for the history of philosophy. I take the view that the history of philosophy does not so much present us with settled conclusions as with alternative models of explanation. So I am, as an historian of philosophy, I am always um, suspicious when somebody says, uh, well, after Kant, uh, nobody can say, so here there are Kant's specialists, but uh, I use Kant as a typical uh, um, author so who is mentioned in this uh, contest. Uh, well, after Kant, nobody can uh, uh, propose such and such. And my reaction is, uh, well, wait 100 years, uh, and then we will say, because as it happens, uh, for instance, now there is uh, a, a, a very strong uh, anti-Kantian push back uh, towards a more Aristotelian view of things, uh, direct realism and so on. And uh, one can still be a Kantian and say that's wrong, but it is certainly not the case that, that after Kantian uh, that was it. These are uh, alternative models of explanation. It alerts us uh, to the possibility of looking at the things uh, from a completely different angle an angle which might be orthogonal to our present day perspective uh, and which is capable of turning the whole picture upside down, showing that there is a competing and yet coherent way to see what is uh, in front of us. So students of the history of philosophy are therefore continuously challenged to make up their own minds and never to take for granted the latest mainstream consensus. Being at the latest mainstream consensus is not a, a particularly good reason to take it to be right. One has to make up her own or his own mind. 
there are alternative models. The history of philosophy is, in short, an excellent antidote to the constant temptation of intellectual dogmatism. I come now to my last example, historiography, philosophy and theological commitments, science and religion. Now, I think uh, uh, philosophy has been uh, slower than other disciplines uh, in uh, revising uh, its appreciation uh, of the role uh, of theological commitments uh, in the development uh, of early modern uh, systems of thought, for instance. Um, why it has been slower? Well, uh, uh, one uh, reason, I think, is uh, especially in the Anglo American world is this a persistent a tendency toward uh, anachronism, uh, which uh, became even more acute uh, with uh, analytical philosophy, which in its early days uh, was even a uh, militantly anti historical uh, and or historical. Now that, that has changed, uh, not least because uh, also the history, uh, also analytical philosophy now has uh, a history. And people uh, have to realize that if you are uh, speaking about uh, Frege or Russell, now you are speaking of the history of uh, um, certain uh, views. But uh, still, I think uh, uh, there is uh, work to be done. And in other fields, especially the history of science, uh, uh, these uh, scholars have been much more uh, on, on their feet and uh, prompt uh, in uh, recognizing uh, the importance, for instance, of theological commitments uh, in uh, the development of early modern uh, systems of thought. And here we have, you have uh, Niccolò Guicciardini, who is uh, a world leading authority on all this. Uh, and uh, well, if we take uh, Newton, uh, for instance, uh, that is uh, a, a very good uh, case in point, but there are there are uh, uh, other examples. The work of uh, Charles Webster, for instance, uh, has been really groundbreaking in all this. But let's say now we have uh, we have taken on board uh, that uh, is an important part of uh, uh, philosophy to have uh, this uh, sub discipline, uh, which is. Uh, the history of philosophy, which has uh, its own uh, um, its own uh, uh, role to play, and let's say that now we take on board that also other uh, non strictly theolo um, philosophical commitments should be taken into account. But uh, even if we take on board all that, uh, one uh, could uh, still argue that uh, non strictly. Uh, one could still wonder, if you like, uh, whether taking into account uh, no strictly philosophical commitment uh, really matters uh, in uh, philosophy. One could uh, still say, well, uh, what ultimately matters in philosophy is the quality and cogency of the arguments, not whether they were put forward by this uh, or that person in this uh, or that form. So that is really not what uh, is at stake. Well, uh, I think that uh, this view overlooks the fact that the quality and cogency of the arguments is much more likely to be uncovered uh, if one pays uh, close attention uh, to the way in which uh, extraordinarily penetrating minds really present these arguments as well as uh, to the contests uh, which implicitly fill uh, the premises uh, of what are often uh, anti-mimetic uh, arguments. So it seems to me that uh, the temptation uh, of creating a straw man and then say, oh, Descartes uh, made this and that mistake, Locke made this and that mistake, uh, Plato this and, well, uh, if they, that is a straw man, well, you can uh, put the label uh, Descartes, uh, Locke, uh, as there is, uh, for instance, nowadays a particularly um, fashionable label uh, in epistemology is that the so-called Lockean thesis. Uh, well, then uh, it's easy then uh, to knock down a straw man. 
But uh, if you look at what really the arguments were, well, these people are not likely just to commit uh, uh, easy fallacy and, and things like that. So I think there is something to, to, give, to be gained for uh, understanding the quality and cogency of the arguments in uh, really paying attention to what these people really said. And in order to understand that, you have to take into account the language, the context, what was the philosophical conversation, which may well be very different from our philosophical conversation. So I think that superior minds are few and far between, and there is a great deal to be gained from listening to what they actually thought. By the same token, there is a great deal that philosophy can gain in terms of refining and advancing its argument from really listening to its history. So I come now to my conclusion. The first example uh, from epistemology shows, amongst other things, uh, that uh, the genuine insights of historical authors uh, can be overlooked or distorted uh, if approached uh, anachronistically by projecting a present day views uh, onto the past. Past authors sometimes taught in ways which are genuinely different from those in which we have, we have come to think of a problem. And this difference, the very fact that it is different and they don't think like us, may alert us to the alternative and fruitful, to alternative and fruitful ways of approaching the problem. As the second example tries to show, one encounters, for instance, coherent but competing metaphysical models which turn each other upside down. You can have, as I have been discussing repeatedly, two alternatives, for instance, a top-down order of explanation or a bottom-up order of explanation. And depending on which model you go for, a lot of things will change. While one fundamental alternative may have a more intuitive appeal for some of us than for others, may well ultimately depend on our pre-theoretical or not strictly philosophical commitments. So it could well be that a top-down order of explanation just doesn't resonate with you and that you naturally gravitate towards a bottom-up order of explanation. And why? Because the top-down order of explanation will explain things which doesn't matter to you, doesn't, you don't care about, and the bottom-up order of explanation will do that for you, or the other way around. The bottom-up just doesn't capture things which for you are, uh, are as it were, non-negotiable. You could lose something else in the philosophical explanation, but not that. Otherwise, all the rest doesn't make sense anymore. That is, uh, there are uh, what uh, resonates with you may, be, may well depend on some pre-theoretical commitments uh, that uh, of what on what uh, seems initially right or non-negotiable to us, and which then we set about to investigate and to test as rationally, rigorously, and prejudice-free as we can. It could well be that you start from a bottom-up approach, because that is what resonates with you. You investigate that, you interrogate that, and then you have to give up and say, no, actually, I have to switch. And uh, the other way around uh, can happen to the top-down uh, theorist. Uh, you will start with that, uh, thinking that will explain, and then you have to give up and to say, no, actually, once I look into it uh, rigorously, rationally, prejudice-free, I have to conclude that that does not explain what really matters. This is why, as I try to show with my third example, it is often essential to take into account 
such broader intellectual commitments in order to fully appreciate the philosophical reasoning of other people, including historical authors. The upshot is that the study of the history of philosophy as an innovative and I would say subversive potential. It trains the mind to think alternatively about the problems of enduring the philosophical relevance and to remain alert to the danger of intellectual dogmatism of the latest orthodoxy. This is not to say that uh, um, the challenge to a current orthodoxy should always result in its rejection. There is nothing wrong in principle with ending up even more convinced by the current orthodoxy or never being shaken from one's endorsement of a current view. The point is rather that the history of philosophy helps to avoid taking current orthodoxy for granted. It seems to me that resisting the uncritical endorsement of whatever view, including prevailing views, is one of the key aims of philosophical thinking. Insofar as the history of philosophy contributes in a distinctive way to the forging of critical independence, it contributes to the aims of philosophy as such. Once again, uh, this is not to claim that critical independence uh, can be achieved only through the history of philosophy or is best achieved uh, through the history of philosophy. My claim is more modestly that the history of philosophy contributes in a distinctive and significant way to achieving uh, these uh, goals. Indeed, it often deals uh, with the history of uh, paradigm shifting thinking uh, by extraordinary minds who thought outside the box. Often uh, when uh, one does only, as it were, uh, constructed uh, philosophy, um, discussing uh, in, in uh, um, just, uh, a, as it were, contemporary uh, register, what uh, happens is that there is a lot of what Kuhn would have called uh, normal science. If you look at the um, uh, the mainstream journals, there is a lot of normal sci science that just working inside the paradigm and uh, moving, explaining it better and so on. Well, in the history of philosophy, is an history of uh, shifting the paradigm, being uh, confronted uh, with uh, vastly different views uh, and alternative ways of thinking. So there is a great deal to be gained by continuing to engage in this long, broad and deep conversation to benefit from its insights, to avoid the pitfalls which have already been exposed, stopping as it were reinventing the wheel all the time, and take forward the journey of philosophy to the next stage of, ne of novel perspectives. So that was uh, it. I stop sharing. Uh, and uh, so this is my pitch for the history of philosophy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, and, you. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Maria Rosa, for this. Uh, uh, brilliant and stimulating uh, presentation. And for, um, for now on, uh, I propose uh, to, uh, to the colleague uh, of uh, uh, recruiting uh, Maria Rosa for uh, preparing a clip for the presentation of our curriculum of history in, in history of philosophy for our master. No, I, <laughs> I say seriously because Anyway, I think that uh, there are uh, uh, many questions or reactions uh, to this fascinating uh, uh, exposition. So, please. So, shall I um, suggest that we follow the same method? We yeah. follow for uh, the seminar, the doctoral seminar, and that is that uh, 
you write in the chat uh, Q or C just uh, to announce that you have uh, a comment or a question. And if you have uh, a follow up uh, on what somebody asked uh, or uh, uh, offered as a comment uh, direct, uh, directly related, uh, you write a finger. And uh, this uh, will give me uh, the order in which uh, uh, people have, uh, as it were, announced themselves. Uh, remember also that the finger trumps and, uh, but there is uh, no abuse of fingers as a way <laughs> to jump the queue. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I look forward to what you think. Maybe in Italy it's not as acute as uh, it is uh, um, when uh, you work in an Anglo-American uh, contest. So let me see, sorry, I should go down to... Okay, so Maria Regina has a question. Uh, mm, when I read your beautiful some years ago, uh, I really gained benefit. I I am in the in theoretical philosophy actually, so maybe my perspective uh, is a little bit different. But uh, I am currently working on Perse manuscripts, so in a way, of course, I am doing history of philosophy as well. So. Um, I am really like with you when you talk about this, the importance of um, showing alternatives to the tendency of anachronism or intellectual dogmatism. But um, the more I study uh, my philosophers, such as Peirce, the more I have um, a question that maybe is just, what do you think is the, the role and the relevance of interpretation in the history of philosophy? I am, I am asking the question because um, I see many times that when I study first and he refers to other authors of the history of philosophy, then I, I, I go to those authors and study them. And obviously there are uh, always discrepancies. OK, so there is um, a high degree of interpretation in the way philosophers uh, read the history of philosopher, like a Matryoshka game. OK, uh, and so um, what I think is that, of course, uh, in philosophy, uh, in other philosophers, at least, there is a very important role of interpretation. Uh, and sometimes I am stuck because I study Peirce, who study other authors, who uh, as well as study other authors and even live the, in different contexts, etc., etc., etc. So it's like um, a recursive history of philosophy. I don't know what to say. Uh, and so, um, so here is my question: What is the, the, this role of interpretation? Also, uh, this is maybe more provocative in a way. Uh, I am thinking, for instance, uh, to Descartes. Of course, pragmatism is uh, one of the many uh, tendency in uh, contemporary, I mean, in the 20th century philosophy uh, went against Descartes in a way. And sometimes I um, ask myself, to what extent uh, is uh, um, Descartes thought really what Descartes said and not what the other uh, saw in Descartes writings? So this is a, a, a wonderful question, uh, and uh, really it, it uh, opened up a, a huge uh, set uh, of issues. Um, I, I would uh, say uh, this. There are certain things uh, which uh, are just uh, anachronistic, uh, certain interpretations. Uh, um, take uh, take uh, Russell, uh, damning, uh, damning uh, uh, judgment of life in its uh, monadology. Russell said, well, this is just a fairy tale. This is fantastic a fairy tale. And uh, I think uh, that case is just, um, there are cases in which one is just uh, not paying enough attention uh, to what uh, the way in which certain claims uh, interacts with other claims uh, is not paying enough attention to the world view of a certain author and therefore uh, what seems to you completely crazy the monads what is that supposed to be is just a fairy tale in fact uh, one misses uh, 
uh, some important aspects. So let's put that uh, to one side. Uh, that, that is a case in which uh, we do need uh, to pay attention uh, to the, the context of the thought, uh, the language, uh, the, the way in which uh, uh, people were presenting uh, certain uh, um, certain doctrines. Even so, there are uh, genuine uh, interpretative uh, differences. And I think that is not uh, so much to do specifically, at least the way I think of it, uh, uh, not so much uh, specifically to do with uh, the history of philosophy, although that makes it uh, more acute because uh, you have uh, also to bridge this gap between uh, your time and that time, your language and that language, a certain uh, form of mentis, which is no longer this one. But I think the problem of interpretation is uh, equally present if you are discussing uh, Timothy Williamson. So I see that all the time. Uh, you, you go to conferences and people are just uh, are there uh, uh, fighting with each other, uh, interpreting uh, what this means and what the consequences of that are. And, uh, and uh, depending on how you interpret uh, the coherence or lack of coherence of a set of claims, uh, you will uh, draw certain consequences. And I think uh, that is an aspect uh, which uh, we find uh, also when uh, uh, contemporary authors uh, are uh, talking to each other, Leibniz being another case in point, uh, uh, when he's discussing uh, to the boss or with, uh, uh, with Bale, uh, all the time saying, uh, Mr. Bale doesn't quite get it. I told him already, I wrote to him, and still he doesn't get it. So, and they were contemporary authors, so they were in the same, but clearly Bale was interpreted things in a different way, Leibniz was interpreted in another way, they, they, and is, uh, is uh, uh, as it were, again, this uh, a broader worldview, which uh, then also shape the way in which we are interpreting uh, uh, certain claims. So I think it's a more general, uh, um, issue and uh, myself, uh, when I am, uh, for instance, in my current project, uh, presenting my own interpretation of how the history of epistemology went uh, and the distinction in kind between knowledge and belief, uh, other historians of philosophy which are uh, equally uh, serious uh, or more and uh, equally knowledgeable or much more uh, will uh, disagree on certain interpretation of, of uh, one author and the other. But I think uh, this is part also, not only of, of contemporary conversation, uh, but also of history more generally, because uh, it's not that uh, there is uh, some uh, objective uh, historical uh, uh, fact uh, to be there, to be discovered if only we, um, we discovered it. Uh, but uh, also history is, is, is made uh, of interpretation of what was uh, really going on uh, in uh, Nazi German, uh, what was uh, really going on in the, in the First World War, uh, what were the causes. Uh, and it's not that, uh, well, if you were living back then, uh, you would have seen uh, all the causes, uh, one in front of the other, uh, because otherwise, uh, nowadays, we would know what is going on uh, in the British government. Uh, uh, and uh, still, we don't know. You, you, you lack uh, access uh, to a number of things, uh, and uh, you will never uh, have access to all that. Uh, and therefore, it's also a matter of interpretation. So I think interpretation is a factor of life, uh, is a fact of uh, interpersonal uh, relationship, uh, which goes both uh, synchronically and uh, diachronically. So thank you very much. That is indeed a huge, a huge issue. So uh, I have here Owen, uh, JC. I don't know. Owen is your. JC Owen is my is first all? first name, and JC is my second name. My initials. Yeah. Oh okay. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for the paper. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I found myself uh, really wholeheartedly agreeing with, I think, every claim uh, and suggestion you made, uh, with one possible exception, which I'd like to ask you about. Um, and I'm, I'm at the University of Chicago in the theology department of the Divinity School, um, but I'm actually very lucky because although the philosophy department 
which I, I have more involvement with in some ways than the theology is is quite analytic in outlook and uh, you know register and and so on method you could say they're also very uh, historically inclined and so a lot of their thinking like an, in analytic philosophy is done through the history of philosophy and yeah I really I I, I have more uh, respect for the analytic uh, approach since going to Chicago than I had before I have to say but um yeah, my, yeah so my my, my question. Is, uh, Sorry. Michael Kramer, I think, is there. Michael Kramer is there, yeah, and Jim Conant is extremely yeah, interesting yeah. philosopher, and, yeah. On Lyla, Gilbert Lyla, for instance. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Very good example of that. Yeah, right, so right. Yeah. yeah. And so my question was, um, uh, or the thing I was wondering about that maybe I, I disagree with is the idea of there being a philosophia uh, philosoph uh, uh, perennis. Um, and basically, um, it seems to me like something that Alistair McIntyre claimed about ethical or moral philosophy or thinking might actually, it might be possible to extend his arguments uh, quite unproblematically to metaphysics and epistemology also. And so, you know, the first case study that you gave about epistemology, um, it seems to me like something, the, the moment at which it became kind of obvious that, of course, what the entire tradition was talking about was justified true belief and not some kind of immediate contact with um, beings um, is, is like something that like a historical shift where something perhaps was changed or maybe even broken um, comprehensively. And so what we're left with is a kind of a, a fragmentation of, you know, we, we receive the history of philosophy as fragments in some way. Um, from which we're we're cut off, you know, for, we have a very different perspective. Um, and one of the, and, you know, perhaps the perspectivalism is, is kind of more the difference rather than having any given uh, perspective. And one of the, you know, the things that I think, um, you know, the Enlightenment with its search for certainty and ultimately Kant were responding to was, uh, you know, some things were the discovery of the new world, the uh, historical consciousness arising, um, the Reformation, relativizing Christian beliefs and so on. And all of these things contribute to a kind of, uh, yeah, basically a relativization of values, beliefs and knowledge um, more than beliefs even. Um, so I just wonder if you could just, uh, you know, I don't have a very particular focused question, but I just love if you could just reflect on, you know, the fact that we're in modernity. Is there a particular uh, philosopher of the past whose relationship to the history of philosophy you yourself identify with, like maybe a Pico della Mirandola, <laughs> maybe not that strong, but you know, something, yeah, just, so that's, that's the question and you can answer. Yeah. yeah well, as you thank you. This is a, a wonderful question, a really wonderful. Uh, and uh, it gives me an opportunity to explain a bit more what I meant by Philosophia Perennis. I mean, I certainly uh, didn't mean that uh, there are, uh, um, there are not uh, changes uh, or even a moment of a break in uh, the history of philosophy, which takes things in a different uh, direction. So I certainly think that is, uh, that is the case. Um, a case uh, in point, for instance, is what happened uh, with Hume uh, in, uh, in the early modern period, uh, Hume uh, proposes a certain way of thinking of, of things uh, which uh, um, then uh, really inform an all, uh, an all uh, huge strand of the history of philosophy. So I completely agree with that. Uh, and uh, I also think that uh, the, the way in which certain uh, problems are uh, um, approached uh, um, is very different depending uh, on the time, because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in the medieval period, uh, people were uh, uh, generally interested uh, about the nature of angels, uh, and uh, nowadays uh, that is not something that immediately resonates in the, in the same way. However, when it comes to the nature of ang ang angels, uh, although nowadays people will, uh, will not maybe uh, write uh, a treatise on angiology as such, that problem was capturing something uh, which is uh, still uh, discussed nowadays. 
uh, how it will be if uh, there are created about uh, disembodied uh, beings. Uh, what, what would uh, that mean for the ontology and all that? So that is the day philosophy of perennis uh, I am talking about. There are certain, I take the view that uh, in philosophy and especially in, in uh, metaphysics, but also in the epistemology, there are only an handful of genuine alternatives. Either you are a monist or you are a pluralist. Either you are a top down or you are a bottom up. Now, having said that, take bottom down, uh, top down, that could mean uh, very different things. It could mean uh, uh, it could mean Plato, it could mean Spinoza, it could mean Leibniz, it could mean uh, Hegel. Very different. And uh, one uh, could uh, not say, well, uh, Leibniz is the same uh, as uh, Plato or uh, Hegel is the same uh, as uh, Spinoza. But what I am saying is that there are certain fundamental alternatives uh, which shape the way in which you are going to go. And then I think I agree, I agree with you that there are genuine breaks in the history of philosophy. Uh, that uh, an old uh, set of things uh, comes together to change that direction in the early modern problem. Um, well, uh, an obvious thing which happened was modern science uh, and uh, the way in which that uh, changed the way in which uh, uh, things were approached, the new quantitative approach, experimental approach versus the qualitative approach. And uh, um, that explains, uh, well, contribute to the explanation of why Certain, uh, a certain uh, bottom-up approach uh, suddenly becomes uh, more uh, appealing to a number of people. So no, I, I agree with you, and my philosophy of is uh, uh, really not meant to say that there is some kind of uh, eternal uh, truth uh, which remains uh, um, the same uh, going uh, uh, through the history of philosophy. Having said that, uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to um, justified true belief, uh, I, I, I do think that uh, that is a 20th century orthodoxy. And uh, funny enough, uh, I, uh, there has been a, a paper in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy written uh, uh, after I published my, my paper uh, on the benefits to philosophy and drawing on my paper and saying, uh, uh, actually, even in the 20th century, when you start looking uh, deeper, who really thought that uh, uh, knowledge is justified to believe, uh, you are going to struggle to find uh, something which really says that uh, in terminus as, as opposed to being in the ballpark. So um, that is just a parenthesis to say that I do, I do think that was more like a blip uh, in that, uh, in that uh, extreme form in which it has uh, then been taken up by post epistemology. But uh, there is another sense in which that was not a blip at all. And the sense is this, I take the view, I have argued for that in my paper on uh, um, the distinction in kind between knowledge and belief, that uh, the J to TB plus analysis of knowledge are ultimately the offspring uh, of a um, skeptic outlook. So the idea that everything uh, is belief, uh, and uh, then uh, that comes uh, in different uh, degrees of justification. Uh, the question is, uh, can we really uh, ever, ever um, bridge this gap, as opposed to having uh, a, a direct contact with reality? We, we form a certain beliefs, uh, things as they appear to us, uh, and then we have uh, to find justification uh, to see whether the way they appear is really the way things are. Now, if you go back in the ancient philosophy, it seems to me that uh, that was a debate which was already going on uh, between uh, Plato and uh, skepticism, uh, skeptics uh, agreeing in a sense with Plato that uh, yes, there is a distinction between appearances and reality, the difference is that for them uh, we have uh, access only to appearances, whereas Plato thought that we can also access uh, the forms of what is. So it seems to me that uh, in that extreme form of the Gettier problem uh, is uh, a 20th century blip, 
but in its uh, backbone is not at all a blip, is a covenant which goes uh, uh, throughout the history of philosophy. Uh, is uh, really the um, millennia-old debate between a skeptical and a non-skeptical philosophy of cognition. And this is, uh, I think, an illustration of what I was trying to say. There are certain things that in different uh, incarnation, uh, they appear again and again uh, throughout the history of philosophy. Uh, but then in certain period, uh, they take uh, a distinctive, uh, different uh, uh, shape uh, because, for instance, analytic philosophy seems to suggest that a good way to get to grip uh, to knowledge is to analyze it. If we can go back, get down to uh, its uh, basic elements uh, and so on. So th that is the way in which I read uh, this uh, philosophia, philosophia perennis. I hope that is. Uh... Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful question. Um, okay, I have now two Stephanie. The first one is Bacina, and then uh, Stefano Di Bella. Well, um, thanks again, Maria Rosa. It was very, very helpful and very, very clear. Uh, as usual. Um, first, I, I would like to point out how things uh, seem, seem to have changed uh, lately. Since, uh, I mean, on the one hand, you um, suggest that um, the history of philosophy is primarily helpful uh, for its innovative potential. And then I read in Tim Williamson's last book that uh, the more we understand philosophy as a revolutionary discipline, the larger the role for the history of philosophy. So the, the gap seems now uh, rather, well, breached, uh, at least in, 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 in a large part. So it's uh, really interesting to see how these different takes on philosophy and the history of philosophy are mm, sort of coming together. Hmm? Um, but my um, main point or my main um, question uh, is um, a different one, rather related to the one you, you, you just discussed. Um, I'm extremely sympathetic with everything you, you just said and, and wrote in your uh, paper. But of course, this um, a criterion uh, of the enduring uh, philosophical relevance poses a lot of lots of and lots of problems uh, for potential opponents of your view of course um, if only because as you just mentioned uh, if only because of the many shifts in uh, uh, well in what eclectic philosophy was thought to be uh, at uh, different stages uh, of its history of course and i would have thought that this is when this is where the benefit uh, for, uh, well, this is where uh, philosophy benefits the history of philosophy, namely in giving some orientation, some, some take on uh, uh, co contemporary uh, discussions, not contemporary problems, of course, because we, we are not interested in, uh, in, in, in those um, uh, only, but in, in com contemporary discussion. So uh, I would say that that gives you the contemporary um, drive or the the, 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 the actual uh, drive for the history of philosophy. And then you can also see, I mean, it's not only an abstract definition, uh, it, you can also see um, many good examples in the in the recent decade, uh, recent decades. Uh, I mean, uh, I, um, just to give a different uh, um, uh, case um, um, than uh, those you already mentioned. The history of ethics. I mean, the great rise uh, in interest for the history of ethics uh, uh, in the last three or four decades uh, was very steep and very, very large, very pervasive in the Anglo uh, Anglophone world. But interestingly, after, well, philosophical drives, after Rose, after Anscombe, after Bernard Williams. So um, then we could also say probably uh, something more, uh, well, more positive, more optimistic uh, even for the role that philosophy plays for the history of philosophy. But I, I'm not sure you, you could agree on that. I agree 100%. Uh, I think that, that is a wonderful way to put it. Uh, and uh, I completely agree that uh, uh, there is also a benefit uh, to of philosophy 
uh, to the history of philosophy exactly in the way you were uh, uh, putting it. And I tried to capture that, but uh, uh, by saying that uh, ultimately the history of philosophy needs to be a kind of philosophy. So to be interested uh, in those very problems, uh, which are philosophical problems. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the contemporary debate uh, and our colleagues uh, who do not uh, specialize uh, in the history of philosophy help us with that, to resist uh, the temptation uh, to go down the, the rabbit hole of pure uh, antiquarianism, uh, of pure uh, um, establishing uh, uh, some po minor point of details. I think it is very important, at least the way I see it, uh, to keep alive uh, why does it matter? Why is this uh, interesting uh, philosophically? Why does that contribute to what I was calling the enduring philosophical interest? So I, I see your point as reinforcing the idea that precisely because there are problems of enduring philosophical relevance, we should listen to the debate of nowadays, see what matters to people nowadays, and then see how were this problem ethics the comeback of virtual ethics. Uh, they were discussed uh, in, in the past. And uh, here you find that, that Aristotle is actually helping us with that. So yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, and I think uh, that was uh, is a very nice uh, way to put it, uh, that there is also a benefit uh, to the history of philosophy uh, coming from philosophy itself. And uh, if I can also uh, give uh, a sort of uh, biographical um, detail here. I have found, uh, quite my, to my surprise, uh, uh, going uh, around uh, giving this paper in various contests, uh, that uh, um, the, 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 the most uh, sympathetic uh, um, reactions uh, often uh, came uh, precisely from uh, non-historians of philosophy. People say, ah, oh, well, that's good. Yeah, yeah, now I understand why it is a good thing uh, the, to, to study the history of philosophy, because yeah, yeah, that is stuff which matters. Uh, I, I didn't quite uh, see it from that point of view. And uh, to me, that was uh, um, very, very uh, interesting. And uh, I take it is part of that, that uh, uh, these are problems which uh, matters uh, uh, to people uh, nowadays. That is what. Uh, uh, contemporary philosophers are discussing, uh, and we as historians of philosophy can, uh, as it were, uh, uh, make available uh, broader toolkits and bro broader explanatory uh, models being guided by these uh, wonderful uh, people who have been uh, discussing this before us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Stefano Di Bella. Yes, but maybe I could also give up my question because uh, I, I think that I could only reinforce uh, what uh, you have said in the last uh, exchange. Because uh, maybe it's not by chance uh, if you, uh, Maria Rosa, in your talk uh, um, um, emphasize, you have emphasized the, the, the benefit of the history of philosophy. No? Your talk, uh, uh, which uh, uh, arises from a confrontation, a direct uh, uh, confrontation with uh, the Anglo-American uh, uh, context and the analytical context, whereas uh, for us, uh, who and in a way uh, were uh, uh, educated uh, in uh, in a and a different no, cultural uh, background, no? uh, yeah. also the, yeah. the, the tradition no, of historicism, etc. We uh, we still have the feel feel the the importance, the need of uh, emphasizing uh, also no, the other the other aspect, the other way. Also now the pendulum is <laughs> also in Italy. And so a bit uh, changed. 
No, uh, so uh, I also think I, I also s- sympathize uh, with your uh, approach, and uh, in a way we can say uh, there can be no no good history of philosophy. Uh, to paraphrase a, a well-known dictum, uh, no history of philosophy without a philosophical problem. Okay, uh, I, I remember. Uh, a small episode, another example, Ettore Casari, who was a, a great logician, but also a, a person with a, a, rem- a relevant historical sensitivity and, for me, and culture, uh, illustrated uh, the, an example, no? the fact that uh, in, in Aristotle's topics, there are some pages which uh, were... Uh, uh, so neglected, uh, but uh, or uh, considered as something not very interesting. But uh, he showed that uh, one could uh, draw from from there uh, a fragment, a significant uh, fragment of a logic of relations. So, and if you don't have this uh, this uh, sensitivity. This, uh, this perception of the, uh, of, of the theoretical uh, matter no, at stake, uh, you, you could not understand uh, maybe uh, Aristotle's uh, uh, text. On the other hand, on the other hand uh, there is the, the, the danger of anachronism, no? as, as you, uh, as you uh, said. And uh, um, so, we, we have to to move to the text and to the order with some uh, problem and so some agenda, some uh, some framework, conceptual framework. But on the other hand, we are uh, uh, we cannot we cannot uh, uh, force uh, no, the uh, the order. Uh, and the text uh, uh, according to our anyway present day agenda. Uh, for instance, another example: our Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz uh, is uh, uh, usually uh, understood in terms of uh, or interpreted. You no, know, many problems in Leibniz in terms of possible words uh, and so on. And actually. A lot of, of things have, have been discovered in Leibniz because of you know, uh, there was there was in the uh, in, in the in present day philosophy an interest in some fields of logic and so on. But at the same time, also Leibniz actually was a logician, was the grandfather of possible wars, no. But uh, I think that uh, I, I don't know if you agree. Uh, also interpreting uh, uh, the modal philosophy of Leibniz in terms of our possible world semantics is misleading, is is to a certain extent misleading. Uh, So uh, I think there is, uh, it it is a dialectic which cannot be, uh, cannot be avoided and should not be, it should not be avoided. Maybe it's the, it's the classical problem exactly of interpretation, no? the, the, the first question. So we, 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 sh- we must have something common uh, with the other in order to understand, to understand it. But at the same time, uh, we, we, we should preserve the, the other in its uh, original, no? exactly in order to be uh, to be useful, also theoretical, theoretically for us, it is important to preserve it in its uh, in its uh, ori- original uh, in, in its irreducibility, irreducibility to our paradigms. No? So I don't know. It's a reflection more than a reaction, more than uh, a precise question. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree. I agree. And uh, uh, I think, as you put it, uh, it is really dialectic between these two. And it is a continuous challenge because uh, uh, no matter as one is trying to not to be anachronistic, even if one is uh, a bona fide historian of philosophy, there is always 
a risk of sliding uh, into that. Uh, I certainly uh, see what you are saying uh, that uh, certain and uh, what is uh, was saying also Stefano before uh, the other Stefano before that uh, um, certain debate in uh, contemporary philosophy have driven uh, the rediscovery of uh, certain parts of our own philosophy or they are really guiding us uh, uh, in understanding uh, the significance uh, of what certain parts uh, of these philosophers were, were, were about. And uh, yeah, I think it is, um, it is uh, generally a, a conversation uh, between uh, uh, these two and that it has to be uh, two sides of the same coin. And uh, so the, the, the two approaches, either you do it or you do philosophy, I don't think that uh, really, really work. Also from the point of view of the historian philosophy, so um, it, it's not just that I am saying, oh, the analytic philosophy don't realize this and that. We as historians of philosophy also sometimes uh, in important ways uh, uh, don't understand what matters, how we should approach a certain test uh, uh, interrogate a certain test uh, which really speaks to uh, problems uh, which are alive uh, for people. I think myself that's very important. Why it matters. I have uh, here, thank you very much Stefano, I have uh, here Stella with uh, a raised hand yes. and uh, Roberto, my Hi, Roberto. I wanted to say hello before, uh, who has uh, written here uh, in the chat. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, um, Stella. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a short comment based on my personal experience. Uh, I graduated here in Rome at the University La Sapienza, uh, and uh, I always found that it was kind of obvious to have an historical approach to philosophy. And uh, then for my thesis, I decided to uh, work in the narratics field, which is an emerging field in the last two decades. And, uh, and then I realized how much um, history of philosophy is important because uh, what I observed is that um, in an emerging field such as narratics, uh, without you know, considering what the authors said in the past. Uh, it seems to me that there is no philosophy at all because uh, it seems like people are just collecting data and they don't really know how to interpret them. And so uh, that's, that is also why I decided to change my curriculum here uh, in Milan and uh, I uh, I came back to a, a more historical approach because I felt that there was something missing in uh, in their thoughts, in other ph philosopher thoughts. And uh, what I wanted to say that it, is that it seems to me that uh, history of philosophy uh, is important to shape new, the new emerging fields. Uh, we can, you know, be stronger knowing uh, what other other authors said in the past, and uh, I don't know. I think it is really important because in narrow ethics, uh, sometimes they are just saying nothing. You know, it is they just observe a lot of data that are in contrast, uh, and they don't <laughs> really know what to say in the end. So. No, no, I agree. I agree, and. Uh, um... Is a, is a very nice uh, example that uh, that you are giving, and I, I myself I see it uh, uh, many times because I was myself uh, um, educated in the Italian system, so I came uh, from uh, this uh, tradition in which uh, to do philosophy is to do history of philosophy, at least in my time. And that is what you did. You started in. Uh, in uh, secondary school uh, to go to that and then you go to university, you do that again uh, systematically and so on. And e even if you do um, theoretical philosophy, uh, it has always this very strong uh, underpinning. But I, I was surprised when I, I went, uh, um, I, I moved uh, to the uh, Anglo-American world uh, to uh, Scotland first and England. I was really surprised that uh, the history of philosophy is basically never studied uh, systematically. 
So basically, you have, uh, for instance, uh, even uh, in places which do history of philosophy, you have uh, Descartes, Hume, and maybe that's it. And then maybe Kant, uh, if you are advanced. And uh, that, that gives you a completely different uh, approach. I think uh, that is a uh, changing. I see it uh, changing all the time. I was just yesterday attending a wonderful paper by my a colleague of mine who works in philosophy of perception, uh, works in uh, philosophy of mind, uh, and uh, he was drawing uh, on Husserl. When uh, I first started Husserl, uh, people uh, didn't even know who it was, or certainly the, um, people didn't uh, think uh, it was uh, something to take seriously. Hegel was considered uh, uh, a kind of poet uh, and a bad one at that, uh, but uh, not uh, somebody you could uh, really engage with. And uh, this is changing. This is changing because uh, if you see what uh, Brandon is doing and uh, all of that, uh, um, th that bunch of people in Pittsburgh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, changing. And um, yeah, I think for younger philosophers and historian of philosophy is, uh, is a very exciting uh, moment. And I think uh, people coming from the call it a continental tradition, uh, Italian tradition, uh, German tradition, uh, have uh, something uh, really precious that uh, they can uh, contribute uh, when uh, they interact uh, with uh, the Anglo-American world. Because uh, um, people being educated uh, in Italy, they come uh, with uh, this uh, deep, not uh, uh, as it were caricature-like, uh, understanding of certain figures, uh, which proves uh, very fruitful uh, if you then engage in more theoretical work. And again, I have seen uh, that many times, uh, people who come, uh, for instance, to King's College London for uh, open competitions, uh, and they ended up uh, uh, beating the person uh, coming from Oxford, uh, and why? Because uh, they really know their Aristotle, they really know their Stoics, uh, and uh, when uh, they do logic, uh, they, they really understand uh, all that, uh, not just uh, the, last, uh, the, the last round uh, of this discussion. So I, I think uh, there is uh, something uh, that uh, um, our tradition really has uh, to contribute. I think, uh, if I may say so, our tradition has to be careful uh, uh, not to do the opposite mistake, uh, losing sight of why it matters, uh, going down uh, the purely antiquarian, uh, antiquarian uh, route, uh, because then is what uh, um, really block all conversation uh, in a more uh, international, uh, um, in international philosophical, uh, philosophical conversation. But for instance, for Leibniz, uh, if you have uh, really done uh, your Scotus, your Occam, uh, your Aquinas, uh, uh, you will see things in Leibniz uh, that uh, other people who maybe have been educated in big schools in the US, uh, but don't really deal uh, with Latin, uh, don't, uh, let alone uh, with uh, uh, Greek, uh, they, they just uh, will not see it. They simply will not see it. And so one can, uh, go there and contribute to something uh, uh, which is uh, um, very enriching uh, from both the tradition and I think the Anglo-American tradition at the same time uh, contribute to something which is uh, from which we should learn, uh, we Italians, uh, I put myself uh, amongst the Italians, uh, um, something uh, from which we should learn and that is uh, this amazing ability analytical ability, this amazing ability really to break down argument, to understand what is going on, uh, not to be, as it were, impressionistic uh, in uh, um, giving a judgment of what is going on, this ability really to go down and to see what follows from what uh, and uh, where the fallacy is and so on. So that, that's another, <laughs> another way in which uh, uh, not only the history of philosophy and philosophy should have uh, this uh, constant conversation, but also the continental uh, uh, tradition, uh, which is more steeped in the history of philosophy, and the Anglo-American tradition, which is uh, 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 really, which teaches us uh, how to extract uh, 
significance, relevance, how to really understand uh, what is going on in arguments and so on. So thank you for, for that. Uh, for that example, Stefano as a singer. Only, only remark. Uh, the, my, uh, I agree with the importance of this uh, mixing of two tradition. And my impression, I don't know what the colleagues uh, think about, or, or maybe I know. But the, my impression is that uh, in in Italy also, in our in our uh, uh, tradition now. Uh, the problem is not or not no longer the danger of uh, antiquarian antiquarianism, but maybe the losing uh, the danger is more to lose uh, what was good in our in our tradition. I mean the capacity the capacity of reading a text, reading historically, and so on. This uh, this uh, these skills uh, uh, that you. Uh, you are saying are so are, would be so important, uh, no? Well, that would be a yeah. terrible shame <laughs> the, if yeah. uh, in trying to imitate uh, what the Anglo-American are doing, uh, we were to lose uh, what is unique yeah. to <laughs> us and uh, which really, uh, as it were, offer something that uh, the Anglo-American system just uh, doesn't have. Because uh, I mean, even people who come to Oxford to study classics. Uh, uh, knowing Latin and Greek is not a prerequisite. And of course, you can then start from scratch, but well, I mean, unless you are really very, very, there is a, something there which has not yet taken hold the way in which it takes hold in, 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 in other educational systems. And that is why then you find that so many uh, people who are in the profession in ancient philosophy uh, are uh, Italian, German. There is something uh, which this uh, tells us. But uh, if uh, we were to lose uh, what is uh, really precious uh, in our educational system uh, because uh, we want just uh, to imitate uh, something else, uh, that is definitely not, not a winning move, uh, I think. We, we should be learning without uh, losing uh, the unicity of what we have. And I see that um, myself. For instance, uh, in uh, the US, um, sometimes you get some uh, new philosopher. These are papers on Leibniz in which you can see from one mile away that it has all been done in English. There, there was never yeah. a moment in which they read uh, either the Latin or the French. And uh, um, that shows uh, because uh, certain things are just, uh, obviously, any translation is an interpretation. So they come uh, already having filtered uh, everything in, an, uh, in another way. And then uh, I, one has got to admire the, the clarity, the ability to analyze this argument. And I, for one, admire that. Uh, but it's starting from a basis which is already no longer really Leibniz. And uh, yeah, I have seen a PhD thesis on Kant uh, where clearly the person uh, don't read any, these people don't read any German. Uh, and uh, not even uh, to the point of, uh, well, uh, maybe you couldn't uh, just uh, take uh, the critique of pure reason and start reading in German, but at least uh, comparing uh, the the English translation with, uh, with uh, the original. All, all that seems to be su superfluous. And I think that shows in the quality, maybe not of the argumentation, uh, but in the quality of really getting to grip uh, to, we can't, or Leibniz. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we, we should not slide uh, into that, uh, uh, taken by uh, a urge to get better at the, at the other things. OK, I agree with Stefano's observation. Oh, there is, I uh, know, that was a fingers from, uh, uh, let me read, uh, um, oh, Niccolò here. Can Niccolò. I read for a moment uh, um, Roberto's uh, comment in the chat? I have no particular questions, but thank you for uh, 
representation of the study of the history of philosophy as an antidote to dogmatism and traditionalism in the study of philosophy. To return to Leibniz, uh, have you found uh, any um, thematization in Leibniz's works of the problem of the history of philosophy? Ah, that is a good question. Uh, I would bet anything that there is, but uh, it has not been uh, properly investigated. Uh, well, I have written myself uh, the chapter on Leibniz as historian in the Oxford and Book of Leibniz uh, out of uh, sheer desperation uh, because I couldn't find anybody who was working on that. So my view is that there, there is a, a, a huge uh, um, mine still uh, to, be, to be mined. And I think that I would uh, expect one would find also relevant things uh, about the history of philosophy. But yeah, I am not aware that it has been uh, studied. And of course, as we know, the historical writings of Leibniz uh, I believe the series now has been started, but uh, it, there is not yet volumes. So I think that is a, a, a huge, uh, a, a huge body of material about uh, history, philosophy of history, historiography, and I take also history of philosophy, which uh, has uh, has not uh, been uh, mined. The the most uh, uh, extensive study I have found uh, is uh, a very good doctoral thesis uh, mm -hmm. at the, in French uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So I think here there, there is a wonderful research project for, for somebody. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Maria Rosa, because it's very clear the method of history of Leibniz. But I have no found uh, any thematization about this method. You know? And then it's very clear the relationships with the ancient philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, and so on and so on. But the thematization of the method I have no found. You know? and that, 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 yeah, no, it. me too. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Nicolò, I so, see Anda. So, Maria Rosa, thank you so much for for your talk. Um, I just wanted to react and say something, uh, but I, I have just a compliment, a little observation and curiosity, let us say so. So the compliment is that I'm very happy to, uh, to, to have uh, attended your talk because your paper has been very important for me as a historian of science and mathematics. So I, I have a an interest for for the historiography of mathematics and science so um, um, and so your your paper was very interesting i'm happy that you are uh, developing these ideas very happy about that and uh, i find uh, your your position very convincing uh, indeed the little observation is that for a historian of mathematics well something of what you say is very useful and and it is very interesting to see what what cannot be transferred to the history of mathematics? For example, it is difficult for me to think uh, that what is last is not necessarily best in, in science or mathematics. So if you go to the dentist, you, you hope <laughs> that they will use the latest technology, not, not what was found three years ago. Uh, but what what is what is up to date? <laughs> yes. So, but uh, also in the case of his, of, of mathematics or science, uh, looking back can be uh, interesting from from the viewpoint that you take uh, as a historian of philosophy. Philosophy, you know, is a discipline that has a strong stability in a way. I mean, uh, your idea that there are basic questions that structure. Uh, the, the history of philosophy, even though philosophers are situated and we have to contextualize them in order to understand exactly what uh, the cogency of their arguments. So that's that's very convincing. I find that um, um, also as a historian of science, I always try, well, I always have this problem of striking a balance between, you know, 
between um, between uh, continuity and distance from the text, between for recognizing and familiarizing the text, so to speak. So it's uh, um, there is a lot of what you say that um, resonates with my uh, with my craft, so to speak. But the curiosity is the following: um, if we move, if we rather than moving chronologically, if we move geographically, so to speak, and we move to Chinese or Indian philosophy, something like that. Have you tried to apply your ideas about the, the stability and the continuity of philosophical problems when you confront yourself with different cultures? You know, I have in mind also, you know, philosophers of African philosophy who claim that it is impossible to translate Aristotle into some of the sub-Saharan languages. So, um, so yeah. I would like you to comment about this. You know, it's a curiosity that I have. So, yeah, well, it's a curiosity which actually is become uh, is becoming a more and more a big thing, a big thing because uh, uh, where uh, I am uh, uh, now is becoming more and more. Uh, a uh, common uh, common place uh, that uh, we should uh, open up uh, the curriculum uh, to other traditions uh, and that uh, therefore we should make space for uh, Indian philosophy for I mean Islamic philosophy is different because of course if you go into Aristo uh, if you go into Averroe and uh, Avicenna and that is the same uh, conversation uh, but if you go to Chinese philosophy which is uh, earlier than uh, the medieval uh, uh, philosophy and so on. Uh, then really you find uh, a, a different uh, a different conversation. Um, I think here is uh, another case uh, in which uh, one should uh, keep together the the two the two aspect the commonality and the difference because there there will be genuine different, genuine uh, different ways of thinking about the things, uh, of approaching the, the whole uh, issue of being or whatever, we, we, which are generally different. And I think we should uh, respect that as different and not try to, as it were, colonize it by showing that it is uh, uh, the same, because it is part of what I was trying to say diachronically rather than uh, geographically, that uh, sometimes uh, authors in the past that generally think uh, in ways which are different from the way in which uh, in which you think and may alert us uh, to a fully different way to approach things that uh, it never would have accord if we stayed in our in our worldview and uh, if anything that is even more uh, uh, even more acute as a different worldview at the same time uh, what i am finding uh, just attending papers by others uh, in this tradition is that uh, in certain respect we all share human nature and uh, we all come back to certain uh, issues what is uh, ultimately real this is a question which uh, comes across uh, all that and to me is uh, in many ways uh, the fundamental question of metaphysics what is ultimately real and then uh, we can expand uh, our, uh, as it were, uh, toolkit uh, by asking uh, also other other traditions which may have uh, uh, approached that uh, uh, in in a completely different way. But the the big question uh, is there, and uh, yeah, that is something which strikes me attending uh, papers in ancient Indian philosophy, classic uh, um, Chinese philosophy, uh, the the question of. Uh, what we call the soul, they might call it some, somewhere else, whether, whether um, everything is uh, one, whether there are individuals or not, uh, the, these questions uh, come across, sure, I sure. think. But thank you, that, uh, that uh, is uh, a wonderful uh, uh, thing. And uh, I, I didn't say it before because I didn't want to say something too controversial. The, especially when there are such uh, great historians of science uh, in the audience, uh, that uh, there is a way in which uh, uh, the history of philosophy is a sui generis, uh, and, uh, uh, and in that it's different from the history of mathematics or, or the history of science. There is a sort of stability there, as you put it very nicely, which is a sui generis. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah, I think you, 
you, I think uh, it, it emerges very clearly from your from your talk. Thank you so much for. for Thank you. I think oh, uh, Stefano, I know he has a, a lecture, uh, no. so that is why we we flag it. No, uh, no we, we don't. Uh, no, no. So, other questions or uh, fingers? I think we have exhausted that so perfectly, really, pre establish harmony between uh, this uh, seminar and the amount of questions uh, and uh, uh, the start of uh, other things uh, in the afternoon. So I hope this is not a goodbye, but arrivederci in uh, September, because uh, yes, I, I would really, um, as it were, treasure the opportunity to discuss my uh, draft, uh, the, the draft of this book with uh, the Milan crowd. It's, a, it's an amazing research project, and uh, yeah, Rosa, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you in September. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful you. talk. And I look forward to meeting you here in Milan because we have several uh, points to discuss. Thank you. Yes. We uh, yes. We rem I remind for all uh, people that Maria Rosa will uh, uh, come again, uh, uh, and this time uh, we hope uh, in person in Milan um, in the um, second half of September. And uh, in that occasion, she will uh, discuss with us uh, uh, her uh, ongoing project uh, on uh, belief. Uh, yeah, 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 knowledge and belief, traditional conception of knowledge and belief. And knowledge and belief. And how so, they, they can contribute to uh, present day discussion on epistemology. Yeah. Right. So, th thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to you and thank you, Diana, for inviting me. It's uh, really a, a wonderful opportunity for me, and I, I truly enjoyed that. Uh, these uh, seminars and uh, this uh, this paper today, despite being uh, um, virtual, I have to say I enjoyed it more than I expected. So thank you, thank you to all. A settembre. Ciao. A settembre. Ciao. 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 Ciao.